here we are. All right, so, oh, I forgot to share the screen. Okay, here we are. I think it's sharing already. Oh, it is sharing, okay. It looks good on our end. Looks good, all right, thanks very much. Cool, so, the history of North America. Um, one of the things that I wanna um, kind of, if you, if you know this or have gone over it, I'm just gonna do a real, uh, very general history of this to make a point about forest management and how it's changed <coughs> over the last um, 2,000 years or so. Uh, North America was, human populations in, in the New World were established via the Bering, uh, the land bridge in the Bering Sea. Um, that, uh, that bridge existed during the last glacial maximum when uh, sea levels were lower. Uh, essentially, there was a, a landform that formed across uh, that, that gap between Asia and North America. Um, it seemed to be a, a high uh, latitude, grassy plain that was probably similar um, to parts of Serbia and um, you know, the far east of Asia and Alaska at the time. There were uh, the large animals of the Pleistocene were in that area at the time, and people followed them. Um, the human populations were nomadic, um, and essentially they followed they followed the resources across the, uh, which were largely the wildlife, across that um, gap, and then spread throughout North and South America. Now, one of the interesting things that happens with the establishment of people is that the um, migration was actually faster north to south than west to east. And it's, um, I don't fully understand all the reasons for that. I think some of it had to do with the retreat of ice. Uh, but also the changes in ecological conditions after the retreat of ice. Keep in mind that this, most of the Canadian shield here was covered with a very thick layer of ice, like a mile thick layer of ice in New England, in the upper Midwest, in the, the prairie provinces of Canada, there was a massive ice sheet pressing down on the land um, that meant that, you know, there's no vegetation, um, completely inhospitable environment. And as it retreated, there was also this, you know, very much a primary succession sort of reestablishment in a, a landscape that had very little vegetation, it had no vegetation when it was iced out, when it was covered in ice. Um, I, and I, I may have mentioned this, I, I think I mentioned this previously, but you know, glaciers, Glaciers pick up rocks and pick up sediments, they grind it all up, and then they drop it out when they melt. So the soils were just this jumble of uh, ground up um, uh, parent material. And uh, when you go up to these areas, it's all, they're all underlaid. The parent material is, is typically isn't bedrock, it's this ground up, it's called glacial till. Anyway, the, the, the big point here, again, is simply that Eastern North America ends up being one of the last places for the establishment of humans in the New World. Kind of, um, kind of interesting. I mean, this is uh, just the, the real general map that you get from uh, on, on Wikipedia, just kind of noting that you know, especially far in the north, those were the most recent establishment of, um, of people. And uh, that's important for us because when people arrive, they're gonna, start, they're gonna start doing stuff. And one of those things is the establishment of extensive cultures. Now you may know or be more familiar with the, um, the Olmec, uh, uh, the Olmec cultures, the Mayan cultures, those civilizations, even the later um, descendants of those, such as Aztecs, um, these were mass, quite, quite large um, societies 
that existed in Mesoamerica and, and the Incas also in South America. These were uh, cultures with large cities and uh, networks of roads. Um, when you look at the Mesoamerica, you've got written language, domestication of crops and so forth. What gets less attention is the, uh, the groups of Mississippian cultures. Um, and this is, a, this is also just this, uh, this, this map from Wikipedia, but it, 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 it illustrates the point. These mound building cultures uh, were, existed across Eastern North America um, in much of the forested, what is currently and was forested landscape of the East, and also existed in the transition between Eastern forests and the prairies. So in this portion of the continent where you have a shift from dominance of grasslands to dominance of forests. And it, and it seems that, the, um, that these cultures influenced the distribution of forests with the things that they did. These were quite large civilizations. Um, they were considered, uh, I think it's, it's thought, what we understand about them is they acted like, um, they acted more like city-states than, than actual um, nations. I think it would be the right way to call it, um, you know, compared to say Aztec or, or Olmec um, uh, civilizations. These were at their height seemed to be on the verge of consolidating into a single nation that presumably would have eventually created a network of roads, maybe even a, a written um, language. This, when you look across the world, you kind of see certain patterns um, emerge as cultures domesticate crops, they tend to settle down, they start to develop um, societal structures that kind of you know, expand from towns and, and collections of towns to actual states with things like taxation and, and you know, so forth, road networks and all the infrastructure that comes along with that. The point of this is again, just to make, just to emphasize, there were extensive linked cultures across most of the for, of forested Eastern North America. And this is just the Mississippian cultures. As you go up into the Northeast, there were extensive um, indigenous societies uh, in those regions too. They didn't have as big of cities um, in the Northeast, but they, they were there and extensive within the forests. Now, if you have this many people on the landscape, they're gonna do stuff. They're gonna cut down trees, they're gonna um, plow lands, they're gonna do all kinds of things that influence forest structure. And that's the point. Right? That's the point that I want to emphasize to you. Lots of people here, lots of land that was being utilized to support these societies, and they clearly had an impact. Um, several different management regimes would have been going on here. Uh, there was domesticated maize um, and a bunch of other crops, you know, squash and um, even some grains. Uh, there was one grain that's uh, related to uh, ragweed. It has extremely high protein content, but it's really, uh, really difficult to deal with because of the strong allergic reactions. But um, these, these societies, uh, like I say, they were extensive and they had strong agricultural systems that supported large populations. Right? And you do that and you're going to consume a bunch of other resources like wood and other um, forest resources. And they certainly did that. These interesting thing about these societies is that they, they collapsed uh, largely due before Europeans really arrived. Um, diseases such as smallpox preceded the actual um, explorers, European explorers in these areas. Smallpox in particular, which you may not think about as much, you've probably heard about it because it's influenced uh, world history so much, it's highly communicable. Um, it can be devastating in uh, societies that have not been exposed to 
So throughout the New World, smallpox devastated in indigenous populations. And it seems, I mean, no one was there to document it, but it seems that it, that it had a very strong impact on the Mississippian uh, civilization. Um, and even though the population collapse occurred before most of the explorers arrived, these pathogens transmit so easily that they could have easily spread from the very first contact across the continent and into these um, towns and cities. When the first explorer, European explorers arrived, they documented extensive ghost towns, um, you know, cities that would have held thousands of people that were essentially abandoned. Um, and it's been since kind of put together that, that was probably associated with disease outbreaks. Um, so that most of that collapsed before, um, like I say, the, Euro, the, the explorers arrived. And here is this, I don't know if you've seen this, this rendition of this painting before, this William Powell uh, painting. It's DeSoto discovering the Mississippi. <laughs> this is a really funny painting um, because he looks like, it looks like he's just walked in from the Spanish court or whatever. In reality, his, um, his expedition did make it to the banks of the Mississippi and they were so, they were absolutely starving. They were so dirty and so, uh, I don't know what the, so, so diminished from how they started. Whoever arrived there would not have looked anything like this. <laughs> DeSoto died on the bank of the banks of the, of the Mississippi and that led to the collapse of his um, expedition. He, um, there uh, from, you know, he had very few, very little of his expedition was left by the time he got there. He basically traveled across, landed in Florida and explored the, uh, the southeast, um, kind of burning towns and getting in fights the whole, the whole way. He was able to move across the southeast pretty easily because the forest had been extensively managed and there were systems of trails and, and roads in places. Um, they did not have a good time. They did not have an easy time at any point of this. Um, you know, at first they had a lot of like they had cannons and lots of lots of guns and bullets, and so they they could um, they could overwhelm a lot of the the groups that that kind of challenged them. But by the time they got to the Mississippi, they were starving. They were really dirty. They were sick. Um, and uh, at that point, they split up. One group went down to the Gulf of Mexico, and I can't remember if they were rescued, but a second group actually continued west, and uh, over the course of about three or four years, traveled across Texas and the south and the southwest, and eventually um, made it down into Mexico, into Spanish Mexico, and and um, and survived. Like one of the first sort of. Uh, uh, groups of U Europeans that crossed the, the United States and just absolutely remarkable that they made it. I mean, you know, Lewis and Clark did, were, were pretty awesome. And, and this group, I, I mean, it's amazing that they survived. Anyway, again, the point being these extensive cultures were there. And by the time the Europeans arrived, uh, they had been diminished greatly. But, but, the actions of those people are still relevant to us. They managed this entire regional landscape, and they did it for very specific purposes, for the, product, for the sustaining and producing products from forests that were essential to building these, these large societies. You could say the same thing is true for the, current, the societies that exist in these areas now. Forests and forest products have been essential to building their economies, to building the infrastructure. And, it's, and they still are, and they still are. All right, so um, the part of this paper really only considers um, California in a, in a very small degree, just kind of acknowledging that indigenous people were in California, the emphasis is on the East Coast, right? But um, it kind of acknowledges 
that indigenous people were in California and that they had an effect on, on management. So let me give you that context. California's indigenous people did something that we have been unable to do in our modern society. And that is manage the entirety of the state's forests. That sounds like with all of our infrastructure, with all of our technology, all of the, um, the material that we have, it seems that we should be able to confront our problems of fuels accumulation, invasive species establishment, wildfire problems, but we have not. A diverse but decentralized population, relatively small, you know, somewhere between in the hundreds of thousands, a couple hundred thousand people in California, essentially managed most of the state. That is absolutely remarkable, amazing. Um, the, uh, you know, people were through, throughout the state, the population centers were certainly larger on the coast where there was more resource, but people, um, there are distinct cultures that are in the valley, on the coast, as well as in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and people didn't reside in the high elevations all year. Uh, they didn't, in California, they didn't reside in the high elevations all year, but they did. Um, there were Paiute people on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada who traded with uh, people on the western slopes, um, such as the Awanichi and the associate, associated cultures that would have been at mid elevations, okay? These populations also, uh, these populations largely collapsed through a series of related events. The first one was disease. The first calamity that hit these populations was the same one that impacted the Mississippian cultures. Smallpox was devastating. It didn't seem to have as extensive of an impact here, probably because the populations were more dispersed. If you had large cities of thousands, tens of thousands of people, and uh, you have this highly virulent, uh, highly pathogenic virus hit them, lots of people close together, they haven't ever experienced it before, that's a recipe for rapid virus spread and emergence of disease and then collapse of civil infrastructure. In California, the populations were more spread apart, uh, the diseases were still devastating, but they moved slower. So that resulted in a reduction of the population, but not necessarily a collapse of the cultures. Okay, so people were still there and they were still managing natural resources. The next two events that occurred were first the mission system, which tended to depopulate bring people in from the countryside and concentrate them uh, in the mission locations. That resulted in a reduction of, of population in the uh, countryside. But of course, the mission system largely ended in Sonoma County. So in the north, you've still got, um, you've still got populations that are, are being impacted by it, but to a different degree. Um, the last and, and certainly ugliest period is, a, is the state-sponsored genocide of California indigenous people. And this is, this is really ugly. There's no other way, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It's a genocide. There were uh, bounties on, uh, in, on people, uh, men, women, and children, indigenous people, and uh, that were sponsored by the state of California, uh, awarded by the, by the state of California, that were aimed at reducing and eliminating indigenous people in the landscape. These occurred around the time of the gold rush and post gold rush and seemed to be aimed at uh, removal of indigenous people in order to open up landscapes for uh, the removal of mineral resources. Um, fortunately, those ended. Um, we've. It's a, it's an ugly period. I mean, it's there's just nothing. There's nothing redeeming about it. Um, it happened, and 
it's important to know it. Uh, and there's just, like I say, there's no way, there's no way to, to sugarcoat it. The results of all this is a depopulation and a collapse of indigenous management regimes. The only bit of, um, so the only bit of good news in this is, uh, is that most of the cultures did, per did persist. I mean, you've got a remarkably resilient uh, set of cultures, set of people who were able to uh, withstand all of these horrible um, things that were thrown at them. And indigenous people are still in California. And also managing the landscape, managing it in ways that um, are still, are, are very informative. However, management regimes collapsed. There wasn't uh, the application of indigenous management across the landscape at, um, after 1900. Indigenous management regime, the primary tool here is fire, and it was all across North America. Um, indigenous cultures certainly could girdle trees in order to uh, do management within stands, but you know, stone tools are not are not real great for chopping down a tree. They're, they're really hard to use in that way. Um, but fire is really effective and it's one that can be controlled and manipulated in, in lots of different ways. You can uh, apply fire at different times of year and it's effective for many different resources. In California, um, the indigenous cultures were largely reliant on acorns, for, as a staple, um, and that's true uh, pretty much of all the cultures that are east of the, of the Sierra Crest, east, uh, or sorry, west of the Sierra Crest. East of the Sierra Crest, those cultures would be more reliant on, tend to be more reliant on pine nuts, which are, which are good. Um, pinion pines are, uh, uh, nuts are abundant. Um, they have a lot of fat and protein in them. They're, they're great. I think they're, they, they strike me as being harder to deal with in some ways or less uh, reliable as acorns. Um, many acorn um, producing trees are very, are very consistent about, uh, in terms of acorn crops. So they would be a, uh, a reliable source of carbohydrates. Uh, <clears throat> acorn uh, crops also, acorn trees, oaks, tend to follow um, a, a dynamic uh, known as masting. And that means that in certain years, they produce bumper crops of acorns. Um, those, are, those bumper crops tend to be associated with periods of increased regeneration. That's helpful, uh, that's important for us when we think about uh, persistence of forests. But the indigenous cultures throughout North America also used mass crops as a way of uh, hedging against uh, poor nut crops in the future. In California, we have a couple of species that, that don't, they, they mask, but they don't mask nearly as much as some oaks. Uh, tan oak, which is not an oak, you know, it's a notholithocarpus. It does mask a little bit, but it's more, it's like more kind of constant throughout, across years rather than um, with a distinct mass. Anyway, so what I've got here are a couple photographs. This is a, uh, a map of known sites, uh, villages, and so forth in the uh, Point Concepcion, uh, Concepcion, Santa Barbara area. These sites would have presumably been used at different times of the year when people would have moved between sites. Um, but as you can see, there was a lot of the landscape that would have been occupied at least in part of the year. Uh, and that means there's lots of opportunity for burning. Um, and here's a, a photograph from up in the uh, Klamath region of some traditional, um, of a traditional acorn processing and a traditional meal. Uh, you, I, I don't know if you've seen these kinds of maps before, but um, these are uh, the uh, groups of California Indian uh, tribes. Um, these are kind of, these are neat maps to look at. Uh, there's uh, 
just, I don't know, a, 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 they say, they tell a lot, kind of a lot of information here. Um, like I said, the groups were, were throughout California and um, they're linked in a number of ways. The thing that I want to point out here is you see how many individual groups are up here in the north. The map gets really cluttered up here. And uh, what's, what I want to point out about this in particular is this is the Klamath area. It's really, really rugged. Um, it's, uh, all of these groups uh, tend to be, have strong isolation because of the ridges and rivers um, and other kind of natural land features. So a lot of the same factors that lead to high levels of biological diversity also led to, uh, led to language diversity and cultural diversity. Um, kind of the same factors that influence, uh, like say plant diversity or something, uh, also diversified the cultures. Um, folks are still up there. Uh, I got into work with the uh, Hoopa and Yurok tribes, and here's a photograph from a project I did up there. Um, here's a, another map from the state, uh, just kind of pointing out the diversity of indigenous languages, and there's there's certainly some some also some um, really surprising things that come out of this. You know, a lot of the a lot of the language families, you know, the Central Valley language families tend to be associated. These ones down uh, in the desert areas tend to be associated with, with tribes that are south of the border or from the interior deserts. That that's not that surprising. Um, but up here in the Klamath, again, you have both local diversification of language and you have this a pocket of Algonquin uh, language families. The, this is a little isolated pocket, pocket of Algonquin uh, uh, of languages that are in the Algonquin language family. Their closest known associates are on the East Coast. So way out in New England, you've got all these Algonquin language families, and they're all kind of related across the Northeast. And then there's this one pocket in California. That language family is not closely related to the rest of these. So languages tell you a story. They, they are a living history of human, um, they're a, 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 a kind of living history of, of people. They can be hard to sort of um, tease apart individual events, but clearly at some point, peoples of the Algonquin language family somehow got into two different, very different parts of, of uh, North America. And it's not clear who came first, if um, the Yurok uh, descendants came from the East Coast or if they had been on the West Coast for a much longer period of time. That is just, that's just an open question. But, but we do know that, the, um, the, the, at least in terms of the language families, they're, they're related and they're very far apart. R really, really kind of mysterious and interesting thing. It's hard to understand the history when you uh, have so little information about it. But. And here's some of the things that go on in California. I've gotten to participate in one of these community events. I really enjoyed it. Um, this is a tan oak porridge. It's an acorn porridge. I processed acorns myself. It's pretty labor intensive, you know, I mean, depending on the species. Tan oak's pretty easy, relatively easy. It opens, it's easy to open, it's easy to leach. Acorns, um, a lot of the red oaks, they're toxic if you try to eat them plain, but you can, they have too much tannin in them. But it's easy to get it out. You can leach it with, uh, by boiling them or um, they can be, even some of the traditional ways sort of bury them in the sediments of rivers and then they leach out slowly. Um, I've always boiled them because I'm, uh, I'm not Indian and um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not doing the traditional way that people do it because I don't know how, um, uh, but I like acorns. So I, I boil them or roast them. You can do that and it, and it, and it, uh, makes them palatable and um, also helps you keep them. So anyway, this is just some of the stuff you eat, uh, the, eat the porridge in a bowl and um, there are different patterns. 
the, the men have these spoons and lots of times the men uh, create their own spoons made out of antlers and then uh, women use shells. Um, that's just the, the tradition there. Uh, they used to be, used to do all the boiling of acorns in baskets. And there was actually a method for doing that, including river rocks that could be uh, heated up and then placed in a watertight basket. And you ask, like, how can you boil acorns in a, a basket? Um, it's one the watertight basket is one thing, but if you have this rock that's boiling hot, it would burn through the basket. So the, the key is you put the rocks in there, these boil, you take the rocks out of the fire, put them into the basket, and then you have to constantly stir it. Um, take some work. But it works. Uh, anyway, this uh, this kind of meal is served with smoked salmon and some other traditional things, and it's it's pretty good. Anyway, the other thing that's kind of particularly helpful, uh, something that I hope you consider, particularly if you're interested in confronting the most pressing land management problems in California fire being one of them. If you're interested in working on that, there's a lot that we can learn from indigenous land practices. Go up to the Klamath and you're gonna find cultures that are dedicated to multi-generational land management and getting fire back on the landscape. These cultures, seeing these two factors as essential for their survival for their cultural survival. And I understand a lot of the culture is tied to various natural resources and maintaining them, whether they are traditional medicines, traditional foods, or structure of forests that is conducive to hunting and other, um, other kinds of resources, fire is a very effective tool for building so the, not surprisingly, these cultures, these, these groups, the, the individual tribes, their forestry organizations, and even the uh, inter-tribal uh, par partnerships and collaborations are, they're getting more fire on the landscape than anybody else. And they're not letting the various obstacles get in the way. So if you wanna know who's getting prescribed fire done, or you wanna know how to do it, spend some time up in the north. You know, try to join a TREX program. These uh, programs that teach people how to apply fire on the landscape. And they end up doing a lot of uh, prescribed fire. Anybody heard of the TREX program? It's an acronym. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, tri individual tribes, um, local conservation groups, sometimes uh, federal agencies will put these on. They'll have different themes. Um, there was one at least two years ago that was uh, wi uh, women in treks. So it was all um, the dominant women crews run, uh, everything was put together. Um, the, the fire crews, the selection of sites. Uh, one of the reasons for having a women in fire or women treks program is that traditionally in indigenous culture, women applied the fire. Uh, and there were various reasons for that, but um, that is, you know, women in treks is acknowledging that and building one. Um, anyway, if you want to get some experience doing prescribed fire, or if you're trying to get into wildland fire management and you haven't gotten a job um, on a fire crew or an engine, which is a also a good way to learn about wildland fire management. Um, these trucks programs could be something you might want to think about. You could get, you never know, you could get the opportunity to use a drip torch, which is kind of cool. All right. Okay, I'm going to stop.